Street Life Ministries is a Christ following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people. And today, we'd like to share one of those with you. Hello, everybody. I am here with Fabiola today, and we get to uh, do an awesome interview with uh, someone who was formerly living on the streets. And uh, I'm just so awesome. I'm so grateful to have this interview with you today. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Um, so I just want to ask you, so where were you born and raised? I was born in Mexico City, but I was raised in Redwood City. Raised in Redwood City? Yes. So you've been here pretty much all your life then? Like 30 years. Yeah? Yes. So mom, dad? Yes, mom and my dad um, came to the U.S. and worked on the fields when we were very little. Mm -hmm. And then he eventually was able to bring us into this country. And then um, my mom, they were always part of our lives. So here in Redwood City? or uh, Yes, in Redwood City. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yes. That's cool. Um, so... Where did you, so where did you, did you go to the schools around here? Yes, I went to Sequoia High School and Woodside High School for one year, and then McKinley Middle School and Clifford Elementary School, so yes, and then I went to Foothill College and Santa Clara, yes. Interesting, so you did the same school route I did, except for the college part. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't make it to college, I barely made it out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, so give us a little history about your childhood and growing up here in Redwood City and, and just that. Yes, I think my childhood was on the most part okay, uh, but uh, when I was about five and a half or six years old, my father came to this country and that was a big impact in my life. I feel like emotionally there was something missing and I never figured it out until later in life. Uh, we still try to keep in touch, but as um, he came here on his own, he didn't have a place to live or anything himself. so. He had to really start from the bottom up and there were times or months that we didn't hear from him so it was really really hard on us as kids um eventually he saved a lot of money working on the fields for years um he was able to bring my mom and at the time my sister and my brother with us and we came to the u.s when i was nine years old um cool. and you we just grew up we started in fresno for a couple months and then we moved here to redwood city yeah fresno's tough Real hot, uh, hot and, and very, muggy. very cold. Cause um, my mom used to work on the fields there, like on the uh, grapevines, and it was freezing too. And we would just go and wait in the car, try to help them out. Cool. Did you ever work in the fields with your? I try to help them, you know, mm -hmm. but it was just so hard. And I was like nine years old, and we tried, but it was just too hard. And then we just like, yes, wait in the car. So at that time there was no internet, no tablet, so we would just wait there like a four or five in the morning and kind of try to sleep but it was hard <laughs> that's really cool so your parents really tried to come here and live the american dream they really tried and my dad had four time uh at that time he had four jobs and then you know he was really really trying to provide for us and my mom too you know she cleaned houses my dad was a janitor i mean they really really tried and sometimes i feel where did i go wrong <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all do so yes. how many brothers and sisters do you have i have my two younger sisters and then i have a uh, well, I grew up with one of my brothers, half brothers, and then a stepbrother and a stepsister. And do you guys stay in contact? Uh, no, I only stay in contact once in a while with my brother. He lives in Patterson. And then my two younger siblings, yes. One lives in Modesto, and my sister younger lives you in Fresno close? in Fremont. Yes, with my sisters. Yes, my, one of my brothers. That's cool. Yes. So, all right, so you went to um, Clifford, and you went to Sequoia, and my Woodside, friend. and then yes. Foothill. So tell us, so where did things start to go a little bit? wrong or sideways um, you know i personally feel like i had my life kind of planned out how it was and at some point i did i got married you know i did everything by the book as i grew up well catholic but then we switched to christian so i did everything by the book get married you don't wait and at the time i wanted to be a firefighter and so did my ex-husband now so um i became very sick so i was not able to um continue with the path that career so i was very supportive for him to become a firefighter and he actually became a firefighter and I think that's where I'm not I think it be, becomes on every person but that's where our kind of relationship started going downhill there was more income but less time and more less quality time and at the time I was struggling with a lot of health issues and then I struggled with depression at the same time because of everything was going on and then so every time I would go to the hospital I was like for my pain management they would give me like um, morphine and then like 
all of this other stuff. And I was like, at first I was very scared. I was like, I don't want to be addicted. But then they would kind of was like, this is going to help. And sometimes one time they gave me four shots of morphine to help with my pain and it wouldn't even help me. Mm. And then so they sent me home with narcos and all of these narcotics to help with my pain. So I added that with that and my depression and then my failing relationship. So it was really, really hard. And then honestly, at the time, I just never thought I was going on this bad cycle. Mm. So um, after that, um, I just moved out and then uh, we got divorced. At that time, I didn't have money for an attorney to fight for any money or anything, so he kept everything, you know, furniture, everything. That's fine, you know, and she kept her dog, one of her dogs, too, and um, so I just left with whatever I could. The little few things I had with me, I packed them in my car and left, um, and then I met my partner, and then eventually um, the, par the father of my kids, and then um, I fear it was nothing so serious, but I became pregnant. <laughs> And then I was just living paycheck to paycheck because I was left with a lot of debt and no income. And then I was just working like to try and manage and manage. So we were renting a room and then um, a few times we rented our room, we moved out and then they kept our deposit. So that kind of put us in a worse financial situation and I was pregnant. So I was, we moved to another room and we were just trying to rent rooms. But at the time it's hard to find someone who's going to rent a room that when you're pregnant. They don't usually don't want kids. It sounds bad, but it's the truth. Um, and we were just trying to survive of that, survive, you know, paycheck to paycheck. At that time, the father of my kids um, has back problems. He has two slip discs. He had his, a bad relapse of sciatica. So he couldn't move or walk, so he couldn't work. So it was me. So I tried to find another job, and I was a server at a Japanese restaurant on top of my other office job. And then I had a, an infant. So I was like, can we just watch the kids, keep, it, keep him alive, he's not walking yet, you know, and I will leave everything ready for them, go to work, come back, and, you know, I was breastfeeding still, and then go to my other job, and still was not enough. I tried to apply for some, some kind of help. I told them the situation, but because I had another job, and so like, oh, that's a lot of income for the three of you. I was like, but this is what's going on, look, this is where we're spending money, so I didn't qualify for any kind of help. So I was like, okay, so at that time I was like, there's no way um, we can keep doing this. So I would try to find another job, a third job. But at that time where we were renting the room, they were subleasing to another person and we didn't know, they didn't know. So we all got, they all got evicted and they told us a week before this. So there was no way we had money for a deposit for another room. It was just bad. So at that time I was like, I don't want to go to a shelter. For me that was like, no, there's no way I can go to a shelter. At the time, my grandma was alive and she was um, going through dialysis. My father has a lot of health issues and they live a little far away. They try to help as much as they can, but I personally feel like, not ashamed, but I don't want to put the burden on them. They had a lot going on already. So I was like, no, I can still do it on my own. And that's how my father kind of raised me. And my mom's like, no, you can always do it, push yourself. But then I was like, I just, I was like, we're going to have to go to a shelter. You know, I talked to a, um, a social worker and then she's like this is pretty much the only option you have so at that time the first time going to the shelter it was very scary for me because I used to um I used to you know donate a lot of food and a lot of my nice clothes and everything to the shelters before in San Jose so for me it was like oh you know they don't have a place to live you know kind of thing but now myself going into a shelter it's not that I feel like oh I was too good to be in a shelter but I was like oh my god you know like I never thought I would be in this position and with my son, he's so little. And so we went to a shelter and then I noticed my son had that kind of regression on his social skills. It was so harsh on him and I tried to seek help for him because I saw a lot of not positive changes. Um, I would cry myself to sleep all the time. I mm. cry myself all the time and I felt so ashamed. You know, it, it's the worst feeling ever. And then on top of that, around the time we got into a really bad car accident, we were at the shelter and then we thought, oh, well, let's go see the 4th of July fireworks. I was like, oh, I want to take a nap. <laughs> but so like, you know, this is going to be my son's first actual 4th of July. So we went uh, to the ones under, um, it's by a bridge. I think it's a foster city. So on the way back, we got rear ender at 75 miles per hour. Mm. But my car is a Jeep. So it's, the car kind of went underneath. So it didn't cause a lot of damage, but it caused damage on me. Like I couldn't, I felt that impact like on my neck. But I was so shaken up, 
shaken up. So we pulled over, we exchanged information, and the next day I felt really sore. A week later, I was unable to walk. So I was not able to keep working and saving money while we were in the shelter. Oh so it was even worse because I couldn't walk, and then by the time I applied for disability, <clears throat> and then if I got approved, I didn't know what was going to happen. That was lost income. So that was money I could not have saved. So we were in the shelter. When you're in the shelter, um, you have all these kind of duties you have to do or have excuse to not do those uh, duties and then like come up with a plan to save money. I was like, I don't have a plan, I can't even walk. <laughs> I can't even walk, my partner has slips this and with this accident can't even move either. So, um, so I was like, we just have to follow the doctor's notes and directions and I couldn't even, it was hard to breastfeed my son. He was barely walking so I was like, oh, I can't even move. Thankfully my mom took my son a few days so I could recover. Um, but then it was hard, I couldn't work for maybe a couple months. And then by that time disability kicked in and then oh we can't you know backdate it so long and it was a lot of political well issues so um it was our time to leave the shelter and we didn't have enough money to save or anything so um i was like what we only have a few money and a little bit of money and then with this little money either we can rent another room try to rent another room for a month and see where the lead sets or I was like, we can try to get an RV or something to get a roof over our heads. So we started looking for an RV and everything and then we were able to get kind of a functioning RV and it was very little, a very small RV. So we were able to get an RV and it starts like, let's park on the street. I see a lot of them park on the streets. You know, I'm always trying to be very positive and this is gonna work out fine. We'll just we'll live on an RV for a year and it puts us back on our feet. And you know, I started all of these good things. So like in a year, we're going to be fine. and. But then my partner started getting sick. So he was working for FedEx as a driver for FedEx. And then he started getting sick. He had started getting like a boil in the back on his back. And it would just drain and drain and sometimes not drain. I had to help him like drain it and ER back to the hospital. You can't go to work. And then living on an RV is not easy because sometimes you don't have the water. So sometimes he can't take showers. And then I was like, so he kept, trying to do as much as he could. And then I was like, oh, what are we gonna do? And then at the time I was working in an office and then I started doing Uber Eats as a second job. And I was like, you know what? I'm only a few classes away from getting my AA degree. I'm going back to school. That way I can just push it. So I was enrolling in schools. So I didn't have a laptop and I didn't have internet either. So sometimes my sister's taking classes online. She would let me borrow her laptop. And then one of his friends sometimes let us borrow their laptop or their Wi-Fi, uh, their little, um, I um, forgot, <laughs> you know, um, but then there were times that I, didn't, I only had the laptop, so I would put the kids to sleep and then my partner was asleep. And then I would just go to Chuck Donuts and then like at two in the morning and try to do as much homework as I could to submit the paperwork, go back to the RV at six, get my son ready, everybody ready, and go back to work. And so I was doing that. And honestly, there were days I would just wanted to cry because I was so, so tired. And even in the army, the little time I tried to sleep, it was, it was either too cold or too hot. So I couldn't even take a nap. And then, or sometimes there was people passing by and it was just all of these things. Um, and at around that time, I felt very sick. So I lost like 10 pounds in a month. I went to the doctor, so like, oh, it's the flu or, you know, it's stress. So I kept losing more weight. I was like, I feel really awful. Like, I feel like very sick. So it told me stress or IBS. But then it turns out, I was like, no, this is not normal. One time I felt like I was going to faint. I was like, this is, I'm trying to rest a little more. I don't know what's going on. And I took a pregnancy test and it came up positive. So I was pregnant with my now 18 month old daughter. daughter. So um, I was like, this is positive. I was very shocked, but I was kind of happy. But I was like, what am I gonna do? Like, I haven't finished school. I still have a year. I don't, I'm not even, a, permanent resident, I haven't worked on that. I don't know what I'm gonna do, honestly. I, and then at that time, some uh, social workers were kind of, you know, hinting and giving me second thoughts of maybe I should have an abortion. And I'm the kind of person that I feel like to each its own. You know, if that works for some people, I'm not gonna judge them, but for me, it wasn't gonna work for me. So I was like, okay, I was brought up when we're two each, three, each, you know, or four. And then I'm gonna try to find a, find a way to make this work. So I was like, man, how am I gonna do this? So I was like, okay, so my one year plan, I'm gonna reduce it by, before, by the time before she's born. 
So by that time, I was like maybe three months. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I have six more months to get this done. So um, when I was previously at the shelter, I came around like, oh, God bless me. Like, I think I was meant to be there. One of them, it was, um, he would donate his uh, breakfast every like once once a month or something their organization the church would go and serve us breakfast and i started talking with him his name is chris and then we started talking and you know my chatterbox and it's like i do insurance i was like oh me too i'm an insurance broker it's like oh really and we started talking he gave me his contact information and we kept in touch and then at the time i was having insurance through my employer so i was paying money like almost 300 dollars a month so he's like, let me tell you, uh, let me, can I call you to see if you qualify for a better program um, that way you don't have, you save $300, almost $300 a month. I was like, oh sure. So he helped me get through Covered California and I was paying a dollar a month. And then it will also cover pregnancy. At the time, I, I didn't know I was pregnant, but he was helping me through all of this. I was like, oh, this is great. And then at nighttime, sometimes they have this legal um, advice at night meetings. And that night, it was an attorney. His name, I still keep in touch with him. His name is Jonathan through the legal aid um, of San Mateo County. He went, I told him, look, this is my case. My uh, permanent residency expired maybe three years ago. I keep going on circles because I can't keep another job because they asked me for my status and then I, it's expired. So after a month, I have to look for another job to keep, you know, I have my stable job, but I have to keep, and it's very hard. I save money to pay for a private attorney. She said, oh, it's fine, but I, if I take your case, it's gonna be at least $600 for taking your case plus all of these other fees. So I couldn't afford it. So I went to other, nobody could really help me because it was kind of an easy case, but it was not. So he's like, let me talk to my supervisor, see if we can take your case. And then here's my business card, call tomorrow, and make an appointment with my um, assistant. So I did call, so I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna take your case. Your appointment's in September. I was very happy. So I was like, oh, you're going to be able to help me how much it's going to be. So he was able to help me. And then um, I qualified for some fee waivers and everything. And he helped me. So with that, I was like, oh, this is great. You know, and then he was able to give me, oh, you need an attorney for your personal injury case. You need this and that. So he was very helpful. And I'm very blessed. And then so I got my permanent citizen, uh, permanent residency card. And then eventually he told me, hey, there's going to be a clinic. I'm volunteering in um, San Jose for citizenships. I think you'll be a great candidate. You should go. I was like, okay. It was like it's eight in the morning and I was still pregnant with my daughter. And I had the worst morning sickness. I had morning sickness throughout my pregnancy. And if it wasn't that, it was heartburn. And if it wasn't that, it was my ligament pain that I couldn't even move. So I still made it to San Jose, waiting in line like early morning. And then I was able to apply and then for the fee waivers too. So he told me, all you have to do is just pass the test and the interview. But he said, like, you know, probably you're gonna pass. And I was very nervous because I already have all of these going on. I was like, how am I going to pass the test or time for to study? So I would just go on my phone when I was putting my, you know, my daughter or my son to sleep. I would just check and check and everything. So try to study as much as I could. Um, and then that's how it happened. And then now it's like, you know, I was when I was at the shelter, I was very ashamed. I would feel very bad. But at the same time, I feel like God put me there for a purpose. Like I was like, I was meant to be there because I met great people there. You know, I, I came with friendships and then I met these people that helped me guide that the help I needed at that time to kind of progress. And then I couldn't, when I went back to school, <laughs> and the thing was that um, they wanted to charge me international student fees because my permanent residency card was expired. Even though I told them I'm still legal to be here, I just can't prove it right now. So they were charging me like, let's say for a class, it was $1,500. So I was like, I can't afford that. Like, so my attorney was, the attorney at the time was trying to help me with all of that. So after I proved to them, oh look, I'm legal to be here. They were able to kind of put me back on the regular student status. So it was, it was very hard. And then, so I always kept my mind like, you know, I have to do this for my kids because it's not fair for them to sleep in an RV. And, you know, sometimes we don't have a heater and I had to wake up at three in the morning to heat up some water so it kind of warms up a little bit. And, you know, in the summertime, even when I was pregnant, I was so tired, I wanted to take a nap. But I would just put my son on his car seat in the car and turn it on so he could have some air conditioner and nap. And I was, yes, they're sitting with, you know, so keeping an eye for us. So it was hard, but I always try to, you know, you have this stigma for, from people telling you, how can you have your kids living here? You know, and then, we have all of this harassment from people because we were parked, not even on the street, but we were parked on the street. 
So um, we have their stigma, their harassment, we have all of these kind of things. So on top of that, I was like having postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, PTSD, and then feeling all this shame, it was really awful. So I started thinking, you know what? I had to kind of be my own hero kind of thing. I have to do this and, you know, um, I'm here and it's okay, I'm alive, thank God I'm healthy, and then um, I just have to make it out of here one day at a time, but I also had to put my part in it. What can I do to make this happen? What can I do to start making money? <laughs> so I was able, I'm, I know I'm going back and forth in my timelines, but um, I was still pregnant with my daughter. I was able to graduate from Foothill, <laughs> my A degree, and I walked pregnant, and a few weeks later I gave birth. <laughs> but you know, it was a struggle, because I was like, it was, I was going through night school, and then you know, hybrid classes, and there were times I just wanted to go to sleep. But then I had to do homework, and with my son I tried to make it like a normal life. You know, take him to the park, story time at the time with the library, you know, try to make it like everything's fine, you know, trying to cook healthy meals and try to make it like everything was fine, even though he was too little to understand a lot of stuff. But then there were a lot of times we were like very harassed and I want to say it by the police sometimes too. You know, they will come and move, like bang our doors and then the windows, you need to move right now. And sometimes it was like nine o'clock at night or sometimes we we're just having dinners and my son would be like all scared. Well, that's why I was like, Mijo, we have to move, you know, it's okay to a safer location, you know, stuff like that, even if we we're like on a safe location. And, you know, it was like one of those things that he's still struggling with, you know, some kind of sudden noises, it puts him on the edge. So I'm still working on that with him. His social skills have improved a lot. So I'm happy about that. And um, it's just a lot of stigma for all of people, especially women. There's a lot of dangers out there. One time I was coming back, it was like 8.30 at night, and we decided to park by the um, car wash on Chestnut. So I cross the street and I see a man following me. So I hold my son, you know, and then I have all my other stuff. I cross the street, he crosses the street. So I pretend to be on the phone. Hey, you're here, I can't see you, you know, and uh, with my partner. And, and, then, and then I cross the street to the car wash and he crosses the street. So I start walking faster and he starts walking faster. Up. So I started really freaking out. So I, I was holding my son, so I crossed the street and I run. I was like, maybe I can make it to McDonald's. But I was like, no, he's, I felt it like, like right behind me. I was like, I'm not gonna make it that far. So I was able to make it to the liquor store that's right before McDonald's. I made it in there. And I guess the person, I think it was the manager or the cashier there, saw my eyes like, and I was like, I need your help. Someone's following me. So I'm like, oh, okay. So he was very nice. He locked the liquor store. He took a peek, locked the liquor store. And he called the police for me. So I told them, oh, I can see him behind the bushes, but I can't see the face. I just see a man behind the bushes looking for me to come out and I'm not gonna come out. Like I have my son here. So um, they called the police, the police kind of came and they escorted me to my car. So I kind of left and I didn't want to go back. At the time, the, that, that one specific time, my partner had gone to an interview for a janitorial uh, position in San Francisco. So I was like, I can't go to the RV, this is what happened. So he got very scared. I was like, oh my God, what, what are we gonna do? You know, and I was like, oh, I don't know. I can't go back over there. I'm very scared to even go there. So we had to wait until he got off. It was past like midnight. <laughs> and then, so to go back in there. Wow. Yes. What a, man, what a. <laughs> oh, I had so much fun Powerful that. story. This is, this is, I, I didn't want to stop it because I, 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 I get like, all these questions, but. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is just, that's so powerful. Your story is amazing. Oh, thank you. I didn't even know where to go because I, like I said, many people's like, oh, they're probably, probably, I don't want to use this word, but I, they were like, they're probably shooting up, you know, and then I think that's the stigma. Most people living on the RVs, that they're yeah. doing drugs and they don't want to work and they just want to want to play taxes and they make a mess, but that's not even the case. I mean, I mean, I was trying, I was a pregnant mother and then trying to really survive. Sure. You know? Yeah, I know. I, I, I. I know for for my own um, testimony, you know, and story working with people on the street that um, when I when I've worked with the police department, problem is is that you have folks like you parked on the street, but then right behind you or right around you, you have uh, people that are up to no good, and so then the city gets a phone call that they have to do something about it. So unfortunately. They're, they have to move everybody. So yes. you get affected by it. And, and it's like a shock because it's like you're not expecting it. But you just, you know, it's unfortunate. And, they, you know, and I know that the city's done, I don't know if you know this now or not, but the uh, city of Redwood City's got a, a safe parking 
uh, yes. RV parking lot now, which yes. is doing really well, by the way. So we're really, Make really progress. grateful for that. We have uh, uh, Officer Jesse Castro and uh, uh, Terry Chin and um, Hannah Blankenship and, and Dr. Uh, Brian Greenberg from Life Moves. So they've all kind of collaborated together to, you know, it's like an extension of the Maple Street Shelter, but it's it's uh, for RVs. And it's a really good program. It's safe, you know, because yes. there's people with their kids there. Um, it's too bad it wasn't there when you were there. But, um, you know, what's interesting is, as I got from your story, is that you talk about your mom and dad being migrants and going and working in the fields. And, and you, as a child, seeing their work ethic, even though you couldn't do the work that they were doing, but you were a kid watching their work ethic, and listening to your testimony and your struggle, that work ethic actually played a huge part into why you never gave up. I think you never saw it that way, but I've always thought like they brought me here, like my dad risked their lives, you know, to bring us here to do better and this is not better. So for me, it's like at, at the time they didn't even know I was in a shelter. <laughs> so it was a shocker for them. It's like, you're not, even my brother, you're like, you're in a shelter? Everybody was like, why are sure. you in a shelter? Not reach out to me. But for me, it was like, I was even ashamed, you know, because I was like, no, this is not what's expected for me. You know, this is not right. So um, I think it was very hard. And even, you know, when they were working on the safe um, parking, um, um, I think it was Diana Reed reached out to us a lot. Oh, the city council woman. Yes, yes. And then to go to the meetings, by the time I was struggling with anxiety, like postpartum anxiety and depression, and it was just, you know, I feel all these shame. Mm -hmm. So, and times I was working, so I couldn't. And then, but she asked me, like, can I use your story? And then I said, yes, please use your story because they want to put a face, you know, to sure. that not everybody's bad. And then I was like, no, our RV is registered. We go to the dump once a week to clean the water and everything, you know, the black water, they call it. Right, too. yeah. So, um, the gray water. Um, so, but she used my story and my, as an example that not, that there's families out there. And even when I went to the uh, community center to reach out, I was like, oh, you're the family. So everybody knew that there was a newborn and then a toddler, and it was us living there. But they ne could never put a face to us. Sure. But after that, I was like, yes, please, just my story. And then I think they um, talked to the city. They were going through that city uh, councils to see if we, like a safe parking space, you know, yeah. so we can all be safe and all that kind of stuff. It's actually helped a lot. Yes. I, um, you know, not to go on too much of a tangent, but I really wish and hope and pray that Palo Alto and mm -hmm. San Mateo will adopt the safe parking as well. Because what's happened is, is the folks in the RV that don't want to follow along with that, what I, what I consider a very successful program, they're just jumping to these other cities. And these other cities are just, they just allow anybody to park on the street. And it's creating, it, it creates oh. a lot of problems because... The thing is, is that there's a lot of families like yours that are actually really trying to do something, but then you have a lot of derelicts along with it. And um, yes. and so I really hope that uh, the other cities adopt a safe parking initiative because I think it'll help a lot because we're seeing a lot of success come out of this one here in Redwood City. Um, but I do want to ask, so, because um, I know people are going to ask me this, these questions. So where's your partner at now? Right now, he's home with the kids, okay. and then he's having a really bad relapse on sciatica. Oh, he no. still struggles a lot. After his, he finally got his surgery, he was scheduled to have his surgery last year in February. Mm -hmm. But because of the pandemic, that's when everything started. It got uh, postponed, and he finally had it, I think, June. Mm -hmm. And he was bed rested like maybe six, maybe six months. Sure. It was really bad. So I was able to kind of, we had to kind of drain the wound. It was it was three and a half inches deep, five Ooh. inches, five inches width, and ten inches long. This is the boil. The boil, but they had to remove the sac, and it has gone through the muscles around it. Oh my gosh! I have a picture of it, yeah. and, and, and I had to drain it. I it was the first time, you know, I had my EMT background, mm -hmm. like you know, my certificate and everything, and I was like, oh yeah, I can totally do this. But then when I saw it, I was like, oh, I need to call nine one one. I couldn't even imagine. I'm it like was, just thinking about that right now. Like, and then, that's a, that's huge. Yeah. So they told him recovery time was gonna be 14, 16 weeks. I was like, okay, let's try to keep it clean and see if we can cut the thing like in shorter time. So I was cleaning it several times a day and he had to be laid on his back. He could, to eat, mm -hmm. he, I had to, had to help him put him on his knees so he could eat. Oh my gosh, But he Poor couldn't guy. So shower. will will he actually eventually get, will he heal from this? Uh, well, the, the surgery has healed, it has skin over it and it has kind of recovered, but the 
tissue around it, it's scar tissue. So it's not the muscle that, like it used to be before. Mm -hmm. So with it's on the location where his lip discs are. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of strong muscle around it. So now he has a lot of back problems and then it's sciatica. There's times mm -hmm. he's literally paralyzed and he can't even move. The thing is I started a new job three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And then I was doing Uber Eats, I still do, I yeah. have two jobs, but then I was doing it because of the flexibility of like, okay, he's feeling really sick, he can't move. I can go like when the kids are asleep and everybody's asleep, or I can work double shifts tomorrow, per se. So we have an amazing audience that, <laughs> that listen to the podcast and watch the video. Yes. Um, what are some immediate needs that your partner could use and maybe either a doctor or a chiropractor or somebody who is listening to this or watching this video can help, can help you with. They can contact us okay. and then we can get them in contact with you. What would oh, be some things so that could help you? We're going through a chiropractor. He's really helping us out, but I think he also needs like physical therapy. He has been in, the e in and out of the emergency, but it's just very hard because I start a new job. I don't have the flexibility. One of the things could be like childcare for a few hours a day, if possible, and another one will be like a physical therapist. Okay. He has medical, but it's going through loops right now. Okay. Uh, he doesn't have an assigned medical doctor, so he has a lot of health problems. I would say sure. like the most immediate will be all of that kind of physical therapy kind of help him get on his Okay, so right you now. need a, you need somebody that can help with physical therapy. Yes. And you need some child care. If possible, yes. If possible. Yes. I, I know it's possible. With God, all things are possible. Thank you, so, yes, you're right. So I, I truly believe that somebody's watching this and going to listen to this. Thank you. And they will, they will reach out with yes. help. Thank you so, so much. I, I, I truly believe in that. Yeah, Your story is unbelievable. <laughs> so really quick. So I know you came to Street Life Ministries. Yes. Um, in Redwood City. Mm -hmm. And so tell us, so how did we, because it's interesting, because like Tommy connected us, and mm -hmm. and so, and he asked me if I had remembered you, and I, I'm, I don't mean to Sorry sound enough. rude. We have so many people that come through, yes. and I and I did it. And then when I, I was waiting to see you, I think, like, oh, I know who she is, but I just <laughs> I, I didn't. So, but let me know. So how did how did uh, how did you come through the ministry, and what what happened? Yeah, it was. I know it was like I only we only went a few times, but you guys were always reaching out, like leaving flyers on our RV. Mm. So I was like, oh, you know, and that was very comforting. Uh, let me tell you something, because sometimes you feel the whole world is against you. They sure. live on an RV. They had to move out of here. They had to move out of this area. But right. then when I see people, organizations trying to really reach out for us, it makes us feel like we are of value. You know, like, sure. oh, somebody's really, somebody thinks we are worth it, you know, kind of yeah. thing. So um, a couple of times we were really, really on a bad budget. So we went to eat. You guys offer dinner times. Mm -hmm. It's at six. Yeah. And then we went a couple of times with my son to cool. eat there a few times. So it was pretty delicious food too. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like you're just, oh, this food is actually really tasty. Yeah, <laughs> so we, really we work really hard on making sure we get some good food. We have some really yes. good local restaurants that support us and provide food for us. So yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with the food that we get. Yes. That's so, cool, that's awesome. So it's always that, you know, sometimes we couldn't make it for all different reasons, but the times we did, it was very comforting. And then it's always so constant reminder that there's other people fighting for us, for our rights, when we just can't, when we don't have a voice, when we just can't fight or stand up for ourselves for whatever reason, mm -hmm. emotional, physical reason, spiritual, whatever it is, there's other people fighting for us. So. I'm always a true believer that you have to be the change you want to see in this world. So right now I feel a little bit uh, ready to tell my story. Before I was ashamed, I didn't want my face, I didn't want nothing to do with it, you know. But now it's, um, if I can be of any help or if my story helps you in any way, you know, it's I'm ready to talk about it. That's so cool. <laughs> well, I really believe that people are going to see this and, and want to help get okay. more involved. You know, especially on the aspect of... Um, which you've, you've hinted on a couple times. And I think a lot of people that I, I do a lot of uh, public speaking. And I will say that a good 70% of people will come to me and go, well, homeless people want to be homeless. Um, they don't want to get a job. You know, the, the, all the stereotypical stuff. And then here's your interview. Here's, here's, you. here's your story. And, and, and your story is exactly the complete opposite of what all the stereotype is. And I want, I want people that are watching this and listening to the podcast to know that your story is probably more so than the opposite, the stereotypical, uh, they just want, they're just bums and don't want to get a job because it's, it's hard. You know, it's really hard. I, I do want to ask though. Um, I am so sorry when you said that. I remember being, I'm sorry. It's okay. 
it's really touching what you just said because um i remember being pregnant um my son was probably a year and eight months mm -hmm. and it was my partner and then i was sitting in breakfast somebody came and started saying stuff to us and i showed up pregnant and they started calling us the f word bumps mm -hmm. and then you know it's like all of these things and then you know, they saw me pregnant, so it got even worse. I was think, oh, maybe, you know, if they see I'm pregnant, they'll kind of stop. But it got even worse, you know? So, um, sorry, it's like, oh, I'm not going to cry. I can talk about this. But um, it just, you know, the whole t thing is, like, more personal when it comes, when they talk to you like that about your kids, you know? Um, when they have your kids calling, somebody's calling your kids a bum, <laughs> you know, and, and they have no fault at it. Um, but, yes. And to be honest, I haven't even, even gotten paid my next paycheck on the first, and I already spent it. It's going to go for rent, so right now I'm doing Uber Eats to survive for those two weeks. I don't have an income because my previous paycheck, it had to go for other bills. So my pg and &E bill is $500 now. <laughs> so, and then I have the rent and everything, so I'm trying to really survive. You know, so right now it's like my partner, I know he's in a lot of pain right now, and he wants to do whatever he can with the kids. And, um, and then right now it's like, just please keep him alive. That's it. <laughs> You know, and I know he wants to do more and help, but then um, they, the doctor did tell him that he cannot go back to do his delivery at his job or he end up in a wheelchair. He needs surgery eventually. Okay. So um, he's like trying to go back to school. And I was like, he doesn't like school by the way. But then um, he's trying to see what he can get online to, to start getting another kind of not so physical work. And then, so for me, it's just one of those things that I don't, see myself as a victim but like a warrior you know it's one of those things sure. that okay yes i know i don't have income what can i do you know so okay i can do uber it's flexible you sure. know i can do that and try to spend time with my kids so, so they're not stuck in the house all the time try to pre-make um healthy meals you know and do all of these other things so yes it's not like we want to be in this situation <laughs> It just so, happens. So, wow. <laughs> I did not realize that we were going to go into this direction. Sorry. I am no, no, so no, sorry. No, 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 no. But you just said that thing that people, I, it's no, true absolutely that they not, were bumped. Because <laughs> I want to say something right now that anybody who's watching you and hearing this. Yes. Because um, we do it both. We do a video. Oh, okay. So on YouTube. And then we do a podcast, which is all audio. Um, but I'm going to say something I've never said in any of my interviews. <laughs> I, I'm right now. Um, people don't see my face, but most people know me. Um, <laughs> you heard what this woman just said, folks. I'm challenging the church to step up right now. And anybody who watches this or hears this to help support you. Oh, thank you. So, so if there's any way that you can step up and help write a check or send a donation <laughs> to the ministry so we can help support this family, um, I've never done. I've, this is not something I normally do. I don't turn my podcast into a donation thing. And I but um, feel I want I want to I want to help support you. So then I'm going to write you a check today, um, um, to help support you and your um your your partner. Um, but I'm oh, also you. I'm also challenging anybody who hears this. I even feel uh, bad about to, this, but thank no, you no, so no, much. No. You're 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 obviously somebody who works hard and you believe you don't take handouts and you really try to make your own way. But you guys need support. And so Thank I'm going to, I'm going to help the ministry is going to help support you. Well, and I you. want, I want people that hear this and watch this also to send some donations in. And what are, what are some things that your, uh, your partner do? What can, what are some of the things that he can do that are not physical? So just so my audience can mm -hmm. hear. So if they have something available, maybe they can start working with him on that. Yes. Um, he, he doesn't say this, but I know he's very good with numbers. <laughs> Okay. And then um, he's he likes the mechanic kind of stuff. So I told him maybe some light work and lawyer change maybe. But right now that's physical too. So he can he can barely walk. And um, I'm trying to think. I you know it's just very hard because okay. he's all he's like he's been doing all of this kind of physical work. So it's now we're trying to see if we can reshift that. Mm -hmm. um, to more like of a mental work kind of thing, you know, like in an office or something. But it, it just takes a lot of more time. And, and I notice he also gets depressed because he's like, we have this stigma too that, oh, he's the man of the house. He has to be the provider. But I, like I told him, you know what? Um, we have to take care of ourselves too. So our kids can see that too. 
okay? Sure. Because if we're okay, the kids are going to be okay. And I say this, running on three and a half hours of sleep. <laughs> but then um, I, I keep telling him, you know, like, I know you feel sad. I know you feel, like, impotent. But just think that housework is a lot of work, too. You help keeping the kids alive while I try to go out there and make some money for us. Because I really don't want to go back. Like I tell him, I don't want us to be homeless again. I don't want to... You know, I'm just trying to do whatever it takes. Sure. So are you guys, you guys, are you in an apartment right now? Yes, on a duplex. Uh, we live okay. on the second floor. And then that's hard too because it's 20 flight of stairs and sometimes he can't even walk. So he has to crawl. So sometimes to even take the kids for a walk, it takes a lot. Like try to get the kids ready, it's a lot. You know, sometimes I have to help them get ready and get the kids ready mm -hmm. to just go try to go for a walk around the block. You know, to, for the kids to get some fresh air. Yeah. So it's really a lot. blessing that you have each other, though. I try to talk. I, to I know he probably <laughs> feels like he should be doing more, but God really knows how to provide for each other. <laughs> I know? did tell him, you know what? I always tell him, like, even if in the future we don't know what it holds, like, if we're not together, I still want you to do good because the kids love you, and then if you're doing good, the kids are gonna be good. Sure. You know. So I always tell him, like, you know, right now you let's just focus on trying to get you, you know, um, situated. Let's try to get you, like, to put yourself together and healthy because if you are healthy, you can do all of these other things. But if you're not so healthy, it's very hard to even get out of bed sometimes. Yeah. Man, this is, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I, so, I, you know, as a pastor, um, we started doing this podcast, uh, uh, I don't know, about six or eight months ago. Um, so my marketing manager, Tommy, who you oh, yes. interacted with, mm -hmm. uh, him and I were talking about doing this. I listen to a lot of podcasts and, and, and I know how powerful they can be. <clears throat> and I always tell Tommy, a after I get done with one of my podcasts, I I'll call him right away. Go, oh my gosh, this is going to be the most powerful one we've done yet. <laughs> and, and every time I get done, I think like God has brought somebody here to do this podcast. And I think is like, that's, this is the most powerful heart touching one and again this is god is god has done wow what a what an amazing work he's doing in your guys's life thank you and just you know trying to stay positive i always pray please just stay positive positive like we didn't you know i didn't have any furniture we got a little furniture my kids beds so when we leave the shelter or or something but we lost the storage mm. so we have two little mattress and my father and my mom put together some money and got got us a nice mattress too mm -hmm. but then so do you time, need furniture if possible, because we were really, we don't really don't have any furniture. And then the thing is, like my son's like, I want my own bed, and he wants like a car's bed, and okay. he's very tall for a three year old. So, so let, I me, let me just, him. let me just say one thing really quick. So everybody who just heard that she needs furniture, I have to make sure that I make this disclaimer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> contact me first because what'll happen is it'll all show up on my front porch. Oh, so okay. everybody that just heard her, <laughs> the, heard Fabiola just say that she needs. Furniture, please contact me before you just don't drop it off at my office. <laughs> I, you don't. have no idea. You have no idea. Like we, it, it's amazing. The people that hear these podcasts and interview, I've had, I've had people talk about needing socks and underwear and stuff like that. And I come, I'll do the interview and the next day I'll come and my front porch is just oh. overloaded with socks like, and underwear. Ah. So I don't want couches and stuff showing up at my front porch. But if you contact us, we will, we'll find ways to help you out. I actually, I. I have somebody in um, Foster City that furnishes uh, apartments, so oh, I'm going to reach okay, out to him uh, this afternoon and see if we thank can't you. get you guys connected. So he he and he gets brand new furniture. Oh, thank so you. let's see if we can't help you out with that as thank well. Thank you. Okay. Well, you said that it was kind of well, <clears throat> funny, but I always think you have to get back. Like I have a friend that she has a daughter older than my daughter, so it's like I have a whole bunch of clothes, and then she gave me a, a lot of it, and I'm mm. blessed. So my daughter agreed, and then there's a lot of nice clothes that my sure. daughter grew before she even wore. So I go and take it to the shelters too. Yeah. So I always try to do kind of stuff like that, and even clothes. I last a few pounds I was like oh this is too big I'm gonna take it you know and stuff like that because I always feel that you know always we always have to keep yeah. doing good I'm amazed by some of the clothes that we get donated to the ministry I mean unbelievable stuff like I, I I've seen jackets like two three hundred dollar jackets that people will donate it just blows me away mm -hmm. so yeah people have a it's cool that you do that and people do have a, a giving heart um you, know, you kind of answered like all the all the like the questions I had but 
I talk so much. <laughs> no, like, but you have a. And I was like trying great. to talk, and you know, I promised myself, oh, I'm ready to talk about. It. I don't, I don't cry anymore because before, to my attorney, back then he was my attorney. Every time I would come in tears and I would start crying because things wouldn't go my way and I don't have an attorney for this or money for that. And he was like, okay, you know, everything's going to get better. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, I can talk about it. I don't cry. And then I, I, I shed a few tears. That's a, uh, no, <laughs> I, 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 hey, you're just being real. Um, so is it okay? Can we know your partner's name? Yeah, George. George. Okay. Yes. So um, Fabiola, I'm going to, am I saying your name right? Yes. Okay, Fabiola. Okay, I just want yes, to make sure that did. I'm not making a mistake on that. <laughs> no, no, no. So okay. I want to pray for you and okay. George and your children. Thank you. Um, I normally open in prayer. I just felt like I wanted to kind of go into the interview and hear your, because I, I knew your, I had a feeling that your your story was going to be very powerful. So I wanted to wait till the end to pray. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and pray over you and uh, George and your children. And, uh, and, and let's just see what happens. I know, like I said, I know how our <laughs> listeners are. So I I'm well I think things will be really surprisingly uh, helpful Thank you. for you guys. It's it's no that's an amazing story and, and trust me one of the things that we believe in the ministry, uh, my wife and I are really strong at is that um, when somebody gets housed is to help re- keep them in their housing um, because the, if there's anything that we've learned is that when you go from homelessness to housed if you go back to homelessness it's it's mentally and physically almost impossible to get back into housing again. Yes. So keeping you housed is is absolutely crucial. So anybody who's watching okay. this video or hearing this podcast, helping this family right now is is really important because we want to keep oh, you housed. You. you know, and we want we want to see George get healthy. We want yes. to see your children you. have a good environment. We all do. I mean, I have yes. children, my you know, my wife and I we we know like your parents want the best for you and we yes. we want the best for our children. So and everybody, I, who could ever deny that we want the best for our kids, right? So yes. um, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. Fabiola and I come to you, and we want to pray over George. Uh, we, we right now um, command that George's body um, be healthy, that his back and his muscle tissue and his sciatica, God, will be healed um, in an enormously powerful way through your uh, your divine uh, healing, God, that you will cure George in, a, in a miraculous way where he will be 100% physically cured and be able to work any job, whether it be physical or non-physical. God, you you are the you are the master of all things, God. You can heal anybody and touch anybody's body. So, Lord, do um, an amazing work in George's back right now, Father God, and heal him. Uh, have him stand upright. Uh, have his muscles and his back be uh, physically 100% God. And Fabiola, Lord, we just offer her to you, God. She is an amazing woman. Her testimony is so powerful, God. The strength and the um, uh, the tenacity of never giving up that you have put in her, God, is just unbelievable and just so powerful, God. Uh, her story, Lord, I pray that her, her testimony and her story just reaches out and touches the hearts of so many people. And for those uh, who sit and they hear um, and they sit and they sit and they think that people just want to be homeless um, they choose to live that life God and I know that there is some I, I, I won't I won't deny that there is some that just choose a, a horrible lifestyle but there is those uh, diamonds in the rough that are living on the street that really are trying to make a way so God I pray that people will uh, have more compassion and reach out more to try to do more to help uh, families like uh, Fabiola and George and their children. Uh, God, to help them uh, get their get their life back together, Lord, and bless her children. God, give give their children um, just a beautiful uh, childhood, a beautiful future, God, and and let them just exp- use this this time and this struggle as an experience of uh, knowing how to um, uh, handle adversity and challenges in life, God. And uh, Lord, give uh, Fabiola uh, uh, opportunity to get some good sleep and good rest. Uh, keep them in their apartment, Lord. Keep them clothed and furnished, God, and let them have a very successful and um, blessed life, God. And just continue to watch over them and guide them in all things, Lord. We give this all to you, and we know that only these things are possible through your Son, Jesus Christ. And in Him we pray. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> this this is, was like I, I'm telling you, this was the best interview yet. So. Thank God you so much, you. and I, I thank you for everything you guys do. Because something I also learn is, um, like, that I'm still learning, and I'm sorry to over talk, but um, 
is trying to stay compassionate and you know grateful even when you feel no compassion was shown to you mm -hmm. so try to think of those little organizations and people that have shown compassion to you like such as yourself and you know everything you guys do yeah so like i was saying earlier when my wife was here um which maybe i'll get her to get an interview uh, everybody yes. pray that my wife does an interview <laughs> yes. so um because you like to volunteer and because yes. you like to do outreach once your life gets a little bit more stable mm -hmm. i think it'd be great for you and my wife to get together and yes. go out on the streets and because you know Redwood City yes. and I'm sure there's a lot of faces on Redwood City that you would probably recognize. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be really powerful for you guys to do outreach together and help out. That will be great. So yes, I think it'd be honored. cool. It, it would really help us out a lot because that's one area that we're trying to grow in is outreach. But we don't want to just hire just anybody to do outreach for us. Yes. We want to hire people that have kind of been in there, done that. So it, yes. it adds to the layer of, 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 of how to help. So yes. that'd be cool. That'd be nice. I awesome. look forward to it. I'll be honored. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. So thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. God bless. God bless. Thank you.